Well, good morning. I got to tell you that, that this, was a, this was a tricky message to prepare because the, the gospel reading that we just heard and, and Tiago and David, you, you all did an amazing job reading it. Thank you. But it, it talks about demons and unclean spirits. And really, that's just not something we talk about much. It's not something we think about much. It's not something I like to think about. You know, we're, we're okay with the notion of, of, of angels, right? These heavenly beings that, 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 that sit on our shoulders maybe, you know, and, and tell, us, uh, tell us the right way to go. These heavenly beings that say, hey, Joseph, it's, it's okay. You can go ahead and marry Mary. She's, she's telling you the truth. Or these beings that say, hey, Joseph, get out of town because Herod's got bad plans. Go. But when we start thinking about these heavenly beings that might fall, when we start thinking about devils, Beings that, that sit on our shoulder and say, go be nasty. Don't do what's right. Don't love your neighbor. Or if we go even further, like what we saw in the gospel story, and we see, we see these beings taking over, doing the equivalent of, of what might happen if someone got my social security number and, and opened a million accounts in my name and stole my identity. This idea of a creature, a spiritual creature taking over, it's troubling. And it doesn't fit in our modern contemporary way of seeing the world. So a lot of times when we read passages like this, what we do is we say, oh, well, what this is really talking about is this is a person with mental illness. And this is a mental illness, and this is just another healing. But that approach, I think, one, it, it, it's not fair to people who have mental, who suffer from mental illness, but two, it is not fair to the story, and it's not fair to the world of the Gospel of Mark. You see, they had a different worldview then in the time of the Gospel of Mark and in the time of Jesus. And, you know, our worldview, we see that there's sort of this, this separation between politics and religion. Whoever's king, well, they were king just because they were coronated king. And whoever's president is just president, well, because that person was voted to be president. And then there's a separation between the natural and the supernatural. Things happen, we know things happen by science, and then sometimes there are things that happen that we can't explain. And we say, they're miracles. They happened supernaturally. But you see, in this world, the world of the Gospel of Mark and people at that time, there was no separation between the natural and the supernatural. God and the gods were active all the time, everywhere. And there was no separation between politics and religion. The king was king because God said this person should be king. And if you were a Jewish person living in, in the Holy Land at the time of Jesus, you were dealing with great despair because the Roman Empire had conquered your land. And under the Roman Empire, they were heavily taxed. And under the Roman Empire, they were oppressed. And in this worldview, they interpreted it and understood it that God had abandoned God's people. That God, who is sovereign over all, had said, I am done with you, Israel. 
and I am going to hand you over and put you in the control of the demonic forces of Rome. So what happens in this story? Why is it important that Jesus is casting out a demon in this story? Well, it's for this reason. If Jesus in this story is able to cast out the unclean spirit, it means something has happened. It means that, that the demonic forces that were in control, somehow they have lost their footing. Jesus is proclaiming, not just proclaiming, but procuring freedom for the captives. And Jesus explains it this way a little later in the Gospel of Mark. They, they, they accuse Jesus of casting out demons by the prince of demons. And Jesus says, no, 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 it doesn't work that way. If a house is divided against itself, it cannot stand. And then he goes on further to say, look, it's like this. Imagine that there's a, a strong man, a tyrant, who has taken people captive. Jesus says, no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed, the house can be plundered. Jesus is saying, you thought God had abandoned you. You thought God was far away. You think, thought that God no longer cared about you. Friends, I have good news for you. God does care for you. God and God's kingdom is close at hand. And I have tied up the strong man. And now that the strong man has been tied up, I can set captives free. And this is beautiful and exciting. Jesus says and is preaching, you can be free. And all the people, they heard it. The people in the synagogue, they heard it. And they were astounded at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. And what does it mean that he had authority? It means this, that he had power. The word authority in Greek is ex, which the prefix, which means out of, and ousia, which means essence or being. So Jesus is preaching out of his being. Jesus is saying, this is what I say to you, but he's not just saying it. He is enacting it. Jesus comes and he's preaching, the kingdom of God is close at hand. Change your mind, repent, and believe the good news. But he's not just preaching it. Jesus is embodying it. He is saying, God has drawn close. God is not abandoning you. And I'm not just saying this. Look at this guy who was oppressed by the forces of evil. I'm not just saying this. Look, he is now free. So Jesus is embodying the message he is preaching. And that was good news to the people in the time of the Gospel of Mark. But what about us? Maybe, maybe you're hearing all of this so far and you're saying, that's, that's great, but, but what? Uh, you're, you're saying, well, really? Demons? Really? What, what about this? This doesn't really fit with the way I see the world. It makes me feel uncomfortable. And it does for me too. But whether we believe that they exist or we don't, 
I think we can agree that, and we can recognize the demonic. Look at this. The, the gospel, the good news that God's kingdom is coming into the world, it brings life, but the demonic brings death. The gospel sets free, but the demonic enslaves. The gospel heals, but the demonic injures. The gospel brings joy but the demonic brings dread. The gospel brings hope, and the demonic brings despair. The gospel reveals, but the demonic deceives. The gospel brings forgiveness, and the demonic brings condemnation. The, the gospel makes us other-oriented, and the demonic makes us self-centered. The gospel produces love of God, self, and neighbor. And the demonic produces hatred of God, self, and neighbor. So we may not be able to really grasp or hold on to the notion of the existence of demons, but we can see what we might call the demonic. Now, C.S. Lewis, when talking about this, he says there are, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors and, and hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. What is he saying? He's saying, whether we believe in them or not, what matters is, are we focused on them? You know, I, I, uh, I'm not a veteran, but my father is an airborne, was an airborne ranger. And so, though I never served in combat, I had 18 years of basic training. And when, when I was learning to drive, we had these big Cadillac Eldorados. Uh, my dad collected them. And I remember driving down the interstate, and my dad said, keep looking forward. He said, what you look at, that's where you're going to go. And I remember passing these big 18-wheelers, and I'm there with the, you know, these, these nine feet wide Cadillac Eldorado where there's only this much space between you and the 18 wheeler. And my dad would just say, keep looking forward, don't squeeze right. Keep looking forward, don't squeeze right. Keep looking forward, don't squeeze right. And the thing is, is that when I'm focusing on that tractor trailer, I'm, I'm, I'm squeezing, don't leave. Keep facing straight. Keep your eyes on the horizon. What we focus on is where we go. So God is calling us in the Gospels not to focus on darkness, but to focus on the light. Focus on the good news of the Gospel, and we are going to be okay. So where is the good news for us today? Well, I think the first part of the good news for us today is, and this one sounds a little bit strange, but not everything you may have heard in church is from God. And if you think about it, think about this story. Jesus is there, and he's in the equivalent of a church. And he encounters someone with an unclean spirit. And what does this person who is under the influence of this unclean spirit say? What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? You notice that this person, this person is, is consumed by fear. And I don't know what your story is coming up through churches but it could be that you have encountered a message that stirs up fear and terror and dread within you. Fear and terror and dread of God. And 
the message of Jesus is that God is a loving parent. And the call is not to fear and dread, but the call is to love, run lovingly into that God's arms, crying, Daddy, Daddy. So the gospel is not going to leave us in fear or dread. But the next thing we see is that, that this person under this influence of this, this unclean spirit says something really interesting. Gives Jesus a Sunday school statement. Properly identifies who Jesus is. I know who you are. The Holy One of God. This person this unclean spirit speaking through this person is saying all the right things. And yet, they are under bondage. They are speaking the words, but they have not heard the word of freedom, the word of release the word of joy, the word of welcome. And maybe your experience coming up through churches, growing up, you may have heard people who spoke pious words, but said, you are not welcome because of who you love. You are not welcome because of things that you have done. You are not welcome because of your gender identity. You are not welcome because of the color of your skin. And what we see is those pious words can be spoken. You are the Holy One of God. And they can be spoken by someone who is under bondage. So there's more good news here, though. The good news is that what we see in this story is that God desires that we would be whole and free. The God who is revealed in the person of Jesus sees this man who is is oppressed by an unclean spirit. And, And Jesus doesn't say, I want you to be oppressed by this unclean spirit because you'll learn something from it. I want you to be oppressed by this affliction because I'll make good things happen and you need to learn a lesson. No, Jesus sees that this man is oppressed, sees that this man is in bondage and desires to set him free. Because God desires that we would be whole and free. And this is a source of joy. And this is a source of power to people who are oppressed. It is this knowledge that enabled Martin Luther King to say, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. It's this hope and this knowledge that we're not supposed to be in bondage that enables people who are oppressed to stand up and say, I am a creature of God. I am a child of God. I affirm that God desires that I would be free. But here's the great thing, is that it's not just that God desires that we would be whole and free Jesus still sets captives free. Good friend of mine, uh, godfather of my son Arden, his name is, is Matt Mercer, and he, he's a jeweler. He, he made my wedding ring, and, and he, he prayed for Amy and I while he made my wedding ring. He's one of the elders who signed my certificate of ordination. And Matt spent half of his life as an alcoholic, constantly wondering when he's going to get his next drink, constantly oppressed by this thing that was stronger than he was. 
And if you would ask Matt what changed in his life, Matt would say, I had an encounter with Jesus. I was a slave and Jesus set me free. He would tell you, I still suffer with alcoholism, but I am not an alcoholic. Jesus has made me into a child of God. Jesus has set me free. This is good news. Jesus desires and empowers captives to be set free. And Jesus invites each of us to join us in his work of setting captives free. I want you to imagine for a moment what it might look like if we as a church became a people who set captives free, who told them the good news that God does not want us to dwell in shame, the good news that God does not want us to dwell in fear, the good news that God does not want us to dwell in hatred. What if we became a people and employed the power of God to free people from injury, to free people from poverty, to free people from self-hatred? What would happen if we were a church who did that, who employed that power of Christ within us, that authority of Christ within us to proclaim the good news of those things. Here's what I think would happen. I think people would be astonished. I think people would look and they would say, this, this is an old teaching but it's an old teaching and it has power. This is an old teaching, but it is bringing liberty. It is bringing freedom. It is bringing peace. It is bringing joy. And I think if we lived as such a church that the fame of the one who saves us and has called us would spread throughout the region and throughout the world. Amen.